Good morning. Welcome to worship on this second Sunday of Advent. It's good to be with you. Um, in recent weeks, we announced a special fundraiser to help serve kids in Minneapolis and ensure that they have a daily breakfast uh, down at Urban Ventures in Minneapolis. And really excited to announce that we raised $7,000, which exceeded our goal by $2,000. Uh, what a wonderful effort. I just want to thank you, all of you who contributed for your generosity. And uh, it was a great way for us to give this holiday season. There's still an opportunity to return your statement of intent card for giving in 2021. Uh, and you can uh, return the card that you received in the mail or go to our website under the Give tab to complete the online form. Very quick and easy. We're getting ready for our Christmas worship uh, this year. Different, but we're very excited about it. The Sunday prior to Christmas will be a version of our Lessons and Carols service. And so be sure to join us for our December 20 worship We'll have one Christmas Eve service to share together, and it will be available by noon on Christmas Eve so that you can pick your absolute perfect worship time this year, one of the many unforeseen blessings of this pandemic. Um, we are making plans to distribute the Christmas Eve candles that we normally have in worship so that you can bring part of the Christmas Eve candlelight experience home with you this year. Um, look for a time in our next e-news when you can drive up to church and receive enough for your family this season. It's our gift to you. Uh, it's time for us to light the next candle of Advent, and we have Jonathan and Catherine Henriksen and family to help us do that today from home. Oh God, we light the second candle of Advent. We seek your comfort, both mighty and tender you come. Prepare our hearts to be transformed by you. The prophet Isaiah announced God's coming to a people exiled in a broken and parched wilderness. He declared that God's redemption would make a highway in the desert and change the rough places into plain. God would come as a shepherd, feeding, leading, and cradling the weary flock. This advent, we seek such a God. Saving God, look upon your world and heal your land and your people. Prepare us to be changed. This Advent teach us to be tender and just as you are. Amen.
Today's reading is from the first chapter of Mark, verses 1 through 8, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Here ends the reading. Well, again, good morning. Uh, Thanks for being a part of this worship today. We're in the season of Advent, and it's about preparing and anticipating God's arrival. John the Baptist, after the birth of Jesus, appeared in the wilderness near the Jordan River, and he said, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. The Messiah was coming. And these were words that evoked the coming of a king. Smooth out the roadways, clear the way. John was telling the people then, and the message is still for us today, prepare. You know, we need to prepare, not to make God come, but because God is already on the way, we're just getting ready. And I was a political science major before I decided to become a pastor, and a lot of my work to that point had led me to an internship immediately following college graduation in the governor's office in his communications department. And one of my projects involved helping to prepare Uh, some of his travels around the state. And this is the traditional work of an advanced team. A lot lot goes into preparing for the visit of a dignitary like the governor. And one of the smaller tasks I was given on the advanced team was to call ahead to all of the editors of newspapers in uh, small towns around the state, letting them know that the governor was on the way. And um, others worked on making arrangements uh, from town to town, on traveling with him and taking care of all the little details of transportation and meetings and lodging and podiums available and anything and everything else you could think of. And that's what preparation for someone like a governor or president or king looks like. Back in the day of Jesus, some people expected the Messiah to be that kind of worldly leader. Throughout history, they were accustomed to asking God for a king to solve all of their problems. So they expected the Messiah, who was promised in Scripture, to come and be their leader. John was Jesus' one-man advance team. John, however, was preparing people for a, a really a different kind of Messiah. Jesus was to be a different kind of king. John wasn't setting up speaking arrangements or hotels for Jesus. We know that Jesus never had a hotel or inn, even from the beginning. John actually wasn't all that concerned about taking care of Jesus' needs at all. John's job was to prepare the people, to get them ready and to get us ready. And this is how John was preparing people, by calling them to turn around from their ways and change and by asking them to prepare the way by stepping aside and allowing him to work, and finally by inviting them to be immersed in something new, a new life in the Spirit. And what's interesting about John's ministry is where he begins. He shows up in the wilderness, in the land of Israel. The wilderness isn't the deep woods wilderness of the boundary waters like we might be familiar with. It's the desert, and that's what it looks like in that part of the world. The wilderness is almost barren. You know, we may not have wilderness like that here, but our lives sometimes feel that way, like a desert. Barren, when life gets chipped away little by little by all of the trials that we go through. When we make some wrong turns, we end up in the wilderness. When we harbor resentment, 
You know, it's hard to find life in a place like that. This year, for many, has probably felt like a wilderness, time spent in isolation during the pandemic, parched by a lack of relational connection and community, weary from the overarching sense of uncertainty of it all. You know, what parts of your life have felt barren? Throughout the Bible, there's this recurring image and expectation that God will bring renewed life in the wilderness. Jesus can bring hope and new life to our wilderness experiences. Jesus is coming, so prepare the way, turn around. Mark uh, chapter 1 says, John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. John was talking to people about a shift in their thinking, a change in direction. And if we're in the wilderness by circumstance or by our own fault, we may need to change direction and the way that we are approaching things. That could mean recognizing where we've gone wrong. It can be difficult to admit that. Uh, Carl Menninger, a famous psychiatrist, wrote a book called Whatever Became of Sin?, And from his work in psychiatry, he believed that recognizing personal accountability and our sin is essential for bringing not only individuals, but any society back to health. That's pretty difficult. The road to healing is a journey in itself, especially when it means confronting ourselves and where we've fallen short and learning to trust God uh, in God's grace. Jesus often extended grace in advance and created an environment of grace. And by doing that, he created safe space for people to acknowledge where they had gone wrong and to make a change. We live at a time when we have more information than ever about how the human body and the human brain and social forces shape us, and even at times influence us to make the decisions that we do and become the person that we are. But all of this information about genetics and environmental factors in our behavior and development still requires individuals and communities and societies to be accountable and to become truly healthy. And from the beginning of time, our first impulse as humans was to assign the blame to someone else rather than look inward. When both Adam and Eve eat the fruit in the Garden of Eden, the first sin, they point fingers Christian faith teaches us to examine ourselves and to do so with courage, being open to changing direction if we discover that we're wrong. Now, Winston Churchill once said, a fanatic is one who can't change his mind and won't change the subject. To prepare, we need to be able to turn around and make a course correction when it's needed. It's always easy to identify other people who need to do that, But John assumed that every person he encountered and the whole nation needed to look inward and see that change was needed not just in others, but themselves. In order to receive what Jesus has to offer us, that's one kind of preparation that we need to make. Um, You know, when we acknowledge our shortcomings, when we acknowledge the broken ways of thinking and behaving that is present in our lives, then forgiveness from God and new life becomes possible. Sometimes that's a process and it takes time. It doesn't just happen in an instant of speaking some words, but that can help us begin that journey. John the Baptist was an important part of preparing the way for Jesus. And in fact, he actually was the big focus of attention for a while. And being in that position, John could have become really comfortable with that. Having high visibility and influence can do that to a person. You know, during my time in the governor's office, I worked in the lower level, and every morning the governor came through a private entrance on that lower level of the Capitol building. It was kind of the bowels of the building, not as glamorous as you might imagine. Um, But going before him was his bodyguard, And uh, he would walk down a narrow hallway past the communications office. And if you happened to be standing in that hallway when the governor was coming, 
What did you do, especially if you were the intern? Step aside, get out of the way. Somebody was the governor and somebody was not. John the Baptist had authority. He became a person of prominence. Some even came to think of themselves as disciples of John, and the Bible talks about that. But John said this, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. In the Gospel of John, some of those who had been following John came to him after Jesus began his ministry. They said, that man who you baptized is now baptizing others, and everyone is following him. In other words, John, aren't you going to do something? I mean, this guy's taken the spotlight from you. And John was filled with joy to hear the report. He responded, he must increase and I must decrease. John was ready to step away and get out of the way to allow Jesus to work. So turn around, step aside, and finally become immersed. John says, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The word baptize literally means to dip or immerse. In our tradition, we dip, if you hadn't noticed. Um, we don't have the tanks to dunk people here, though there's nothing wrong with that. If you haven't been baptized and you want to be immersed, we may be able to do that this winter outside. Uh, we'll take you out for a polar plunge. How about that? Uh, your life, I guarantee it, will be changed. What John, though, is talking about here is something more than water. Whether you're immersed in water or sprinkled with water, the water eventually drips off and dries off. Baptism, most importantly, is an immersion not in water, but in the Spirit of God. And notice that this isn't something we can do for ourselves. It's something that God does. It's not something on a checklist to prepare. It's a gift. We don't control how the Spirit moves. But if you want to know what the Spirit is like, all you need to know is what Jesus is like, filled with grace, truth, hope, and love. The Spirit brings peace. The Spirit brings an experience of new life. Paul sums up the presence of God's Spirit this way in a famous passage. What we experience and what we breathe out is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And when we don't experience that, as is common, we long for it. Even if some don't name God, they're seeking the presence of God to bring love where there's hate and joy where there's sadness, peace where there's tension, patience where there's frustration, and so on. And so we pray and wait, like the people of Israel did for the Savior to come. We pray and wait and do what we can to prepare still today, because the path ahead is still difficult to navigate. We still find ourselves in the wilderness and we're parched, God is near. Jesus is coming. For God to bring life to the barren wilderness may mean we have to notice where God is already at work. A spiritual mentor once told the lead singer of U2, Bono, to stop asking God to bless what you're doing. Get involved in what God is doing because it's already blessed. Sometimes we just have to get out of the way and make the way straight for God to work. And so we prepare in anticipation and expectation of the one who is coming and has come and will come again. Let's pray. God, in so many ways, this year has felt like the wilderness that John appeared in. We long for your coming. Help us to prepare ourselves by turning around where we need to, stepping away to prov provide room for you to work, and becoming immersed in your word and your spirit, which has the power to bring renewal to our hearts, our minds, and our whole lives. Amen. Hopeful the 
Savior comes at last. Furrows lie open for God's creative task. This a labor of people who struggle to see how God's truth and justice sets everybody free. People of Israel, you heard the prophet tell. As we seek to prepare for Christ, we take time for confession and forgiveness this day. I invite you to speak these words with me or reflect on them as the words are spoken. Loving and forgiving God, we confess that we are held captive by sin. In spite of our best efforts, we have gone astray. We have not welcomed the stranger. We have not loved our neighbor. We have not been Christ to one another. Restore us, O God. Wake us up and turn us from our sin. Renew us each day in the light of Christ. Amen. And as we speak those words, we also receive a word of promise and grace. People of God, hear this glad news. By God's endless grace, your sins are forgiven and you are free free from all that holds you back, and free to live in the peaceable realm of God. May you be strengthened in God's love, comforted by Christ's peace, and accompanied with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you join me now in a time of prayer? God of power and might, comfort your people and come quickly to this weary world. Hear our prayers for everyone in need. Faithful God, you teach us to wait for you with faithfulness and patience. Sustain and support us in our doubts and questions. Nurture our faith as we discern and enact your mission. Loving God, you set the stars in the sky and breathe life into the earth. Renew the face of creation where it needs your healing touch. Mend the wounds of environmental damage and restore balance to ecosystems by stirring us to live up to our role as stewards of this world. Tender God, you know sorrow and joy alike. We pray for those in our families and congregation who are not joyful in this holiday season. Comfort those who grieve, be a companion to all who are lonely, and tend those who are sick or in need of healing. We lift up members in need of your healing and hope, especially Orlin, Marilyn, Joy, Lindsay, Daniel, Claire, Jan, Bev, and Carol. And we pray for Marilyn Almain and family at the death of Tony Almain. Draw near to us, O God, and receive our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
We continue with the meal that Jesus shared with his disciples. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. We join together in the prayer which Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. At this time, you are invited to share the bread and wine with one another, or if you are here uh, participating on your own today, hear these words. Body of Christ given for you, and the blood of Christ shed for you. Eat this bread, drink this cup, come to me and never be hungry. Eat this bread, drink this cup, trust in me and you May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace now and forever. Amen. And now receive this blessing. The creator of the stars, bless your advent waiting. The long-expected Savior, fill you with love. The unexpected Spirit, guide your journey now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, prepare the way of the Lord.